Hoje, teremos a imensa satisfação de assistir à conferência da professora Zeto Matebene, a quem agradeço imensamente ter aceitado o nosso convite para participar da 32ª reunião da Associação Brasileira de Antropologia, que completa 65 anos, sendo a mais antiga das associações em ciências sociais no Brasil. Nossa associação tem enfrentado o desafio de articular a produção científica, a organização e a mobilização de diferentes redes de conhecimento, gerar visibilidade, estimular o debate e, nesses tempos sombrios, de resistência. A aba assume posições políticas frente a um cenário governamental que desqualifica direitos estabelecidos pela Constituição e que tem atacado sistematicamente as ciências humanas. O sentido do que fazemos é enfrentar o contexto mais amplo que afeta a antropologia que fazemos entre nós e a que fazemos em diálogo e interação com o mundo. Aí está a importância estratégica de resistir ao autoritarismo e aos abusos com conhecimento, com a troca e com a insubmissão dos saberes. Eu gostaria aqui de agradecer imensamente e convidar para fazer parte da nossa tela as coordenadoras do Comitê de Sexualidade e Gênero da ABA, que é a professora Heloísa Buarque de Almeida, e a professora Luciana Oliveira Dias, que é a coordenadora do nosso Comitê de Antropólogas Negras e Antropólogos Negros. Passo agora a palavra a nossa querida Laura Moutinho, a quem agradeço enormemente ter organizado essa iniciativa, ela também coordenadora do Comitê de Estudos Africanos. Por favor. Bom dia a todas, todos, todes. Hoje, dia 8 de outubro de 2020, já temos 148.304 mortes em decorrência da Covid-19. São quase 150 mil famílias em luto, entre as quais a minha própria. Apesar do esforço de guerra que fizemos, minha mãe morreu em decorrência do vírus. Quando o público da 32ª RBA assistir a essa conferência, os números serão, infelizmente, piores. Mas não somos números. Presto aqui minha homenagem à minha mãe, a todos os mortos e suas famílias, aquelas que, como a minha, estão vivendo no impensável, atuando diariamente no indizível, lutando pela sua própria vida, como eu lutei, enquanto enterram seus entes amados, na incerteza do presente e do futuro em termos físicos e simbólicos. Por minha, por minha mãe, por mim, pelos que sofrem como nós, nesse momento, desse modo, desculpa, desse modo lancinante, gostaria de dizer que esse não é um momento normal. Não quero parecer normal de máscara. Gostaria também de dizer que não é normal nem aceitável o descaso governamental com a pandemia, que gerou milhares de mortes, que poderiam ter sido, e todas que ainda podem ser evitadas. Não é aceitável o ataque à ciência em nenhum momento, mas nesse momento isso ainda é cruel. Não é aceitável que a verba para a ciência seja cortada, nem que líderes religiosos não tenham trabalhado para proteger seus fiéis do vírus e da violência. Acho bom e justo com nossos mortos, com a nossa humanidade e com a dor dos que sobrevivem, que sejam dados nomes apropriados ao que estamos vivendo. Desumanidade, crueldade governamental e religiosa são apenas dois deles. Agradeço todo o apoio que recebi aqui das pessoas presentes nesse momento de perda e de luto. Nessa direção, devo mencionar o esforço admirável da Comissão de Organização da 32ª RBA e da diretoria da ABA para realizar o Congresso no momento em que realmente, como sabemos, a reflexão antropológica é fundamental. Ela salva vidas. Uma crise sanitária é construída articulando clivagens sociais. A pandemia da Covid-19 nasceu operando um estigma racializador contra os chineses, provocando violências, evocando discussões, uma vez mais, sobre a imunidade dos africanos. A ao produzir um conhecimento que é contraintuitivo, a antropologia nos coloca à frente, nas lacunas de narrativas, 
nos aspectos negligenciados pelos números e estatísticas. Obrigado, obrigada aos que estão à frente da 32ª RBA por não terem desistido, apesar de tudo. Para mim, é uma honra apresentar a professora da University of Western Cape, Zetu Matebene. O Brasil é o país cuja disputa narrativa acerca da violência que funda a nação foi confrontada com representações hegemônicas que privilegiam um, que privilegiam um jeito, alguns chamam de jeitinho brasileiro, que amenizaria a desigualdade social a partir de uma linguagem que tem como marca uma ideia de miscigenação que cerziria as diferenças e reconfiguraria as desigualdades. Fundamental nesse jogo de espelhos é a África do Sul e o regime do Apartheid. Entretanto, nesse espelhamento, o Sul Global, o Brasil e a África do Sul ocupam lugares similares em muitos sentidos. A produção da professora Zetu Matebeni nos ajuda justamente a ganhar perspectiva e rever as bases das nossas comparações e mesmo a reconfigurar nossos pressupostos a respeito do que podemos nomear de violência, inclusive e sobretudo as violências racial, sexual e de gênero. A professora Zetu tem uma trajetória extraordinária. A leitura dos seus escritos é hoje incontornável aos que desejam refletir sobre violência, desigualdade social e de classe, pensamento colonial, raça, racismo, questões de gênero, LGBT, queer, em contextos africanos e globais. Devo dizer com felicidade que algumas, alguns dos seus escritos foram publicados em português, na revista Fises, do MS UERJ, e na revista de antropologia da USP, que também publicou recentemente uma entrevista com nossa convidada de honra. Temos uma já longa parceria em pesquisas. Em nosso primeiro diálogo, a professora Zeto se definiu como uma ativista na academia. Ela continua se pensando dessa forma, pois se trata de uma maneira de atuar na produção do conhecimento e igualmente de existir. Sua produção se revela antropológica através de um sensível olhar etnográfico. O mesmo olhar que informa seu trabalho como documentarista e roteirista, construídos na formação em sociologia na Nelson Mandela University, no mestrado em artes na Universidade de Pretória, com o um PhD realizado em um campo interdisciplinar entre a UA University, nos Estados Unidos, e a Witt-Wetzelsrand University, no Instituto de Pesquisa Weiser, de Johannesburg. A professora foi Senior Researcher no Instituto for Humanities em África, da Universidade de Cape Town, e atualmente é professora associada na Universidade de Western Cape University, na Universidade de Western Cape, e ainda professora visitante no Center for Women and Gender Studies na Nelson Mandela University, tendo participado também de vários movimentos, entre os quais o Roads Must Fall. Boa parte do que a professora Matebeni vem chamando a atenção para a África do Sul e outros contextos da África, vale também para o Brasil. O conhecimento produzido no campo da sexualidade invisibiliza, invisibiliza formas e lutas particulares de vida. Na Pride Week, a Semana do Orgulho, de Cape Town, ela conduz quem lê seu manuscrito pela intrincada produção, mas também poderia falar pela experiência de vergonha percorrendo com mulheres lésbicas negras moradoras dos townships, locais que são similares às nossas favelas, os espaços do apartheid e das remoções forçadas impressos na malha urbana atual, alimentando memórias, ressentimentos e a exclusão. Dos banheiros, dos shoppings luxuosos, vamos para a ausência dos toalets das townships e de uma política governamental de humilhação constante e contínua. A vida dessas mulheres lésbicas, negras, ativistas, deram muito ao conhecimento acadêmico. De que forma isso tem sido retribuído, se pergunta Matebeni. Não é exagero trazer essa reflexão para pensarmos sobre as contribuições que somente recentemente foram nomeadas de mulheres negras, ativistas, como Beatriz Nascimento e Indélia Gonzalez, que escreveram e atuaram também com seus corpos, confrontando, produzindo mudanças epistemológicas e políticas. Também Matebeni, 
ao ingressar na universidade, não se via no conhecimento produzido naquele momento de transição do regime do apartheid para a democracia. Quem, entre os que nos assistem, se vê nesse, no conhecimento produzido nas nossas universidades? Os grupos locais a nutriram, os grupos feministas, dando um léxico para o engajamento, articulado uma produção de um conhecimento sempre desafiador. Do seu vasto currículo com publicações em formatos diversos, livros, artigos, intervenções públicas em jornais e várias formas de expressões artísticas, gostaria de chamar a atenção para o livro que é fruto de sua tese de doutorado, Black, Lesbian, Sexualities and Identity in South Africa, e o livro em coautoria co Queer in Africa, LGBTQI, Identidade, Cidadania e Ativismo. Artigos como Intimidade, Queerness e Raça, e ainda as publicações em português é, que eu mencionei anteriormente. No Brasil, costumamos ler, nos primeiros momentos de nossa formação, manuscritos antropológicos de sul-africanos, que por uma questão geopolítica são conhecidos como clássicos da escola britânica. Max Gluckman é apenas o autor mais famoso dessa linhagem. Recorrer os escritos de Zetu Matebene é também interessante para contrastarmos aquela produção clássica com essa atual, que muitas vezes percorre, percorre campos etnográficos próximos. Em um vídeo de um minuto postado na internet, a professora Zeto responde à pergunta quem é a mulher mais importante de sua vida? Nesse curto espaço de tempo, ela presta tributo à mãe, símbolo de resistência e, pelo que eu entendi, de impertinência que lhes criou, permitindo que ela fosse quem ela quisesse ser. Isso não é pouco. Penso aqui nessas mulheres, as nossas mulheres e mães de um outro momento histórico, anônimas, que mesmo constrangidas por narrativas patriarcais ou em uma malha legislativa segregacionista racista, nos deram um mundo de possibilidades. Entre elas, a de sermos mulheres produzindo conhecimento no espaço acadêmico. É assim com muita alegria que passo a palavra à professora Zeto Matebeni, já agradecendo por ela estar aqui conosco nesse momento de reflexão. All right. Um, greetings, everybody, uh, wherever you are watching and joining us today. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I would like to say how um, greatly honored I am to be invited to be part of the 32nd um, Brazilian Association of Anthropology meeting. Um, it, is, it is a great honor for me to be part of this um, gathering uh, virtually, um, and I'm uh, grateful to, uh, to, the, to all the organizers of the meeting, and in particular to Professor Laura Moutinho, who just gave a very illustrious <laughs> uh, introduction. Thank you so much. Um, um, to, uh, to Thais, who's doing the uh, senior tenures uh, translations and interpretation. Thank you so much. Uh, to Carol and everybody else who's been involved in the process. Um, as I said, it is, a, it is a, a, a great pleasure and great honor for me to be part of this meeting today. Um, and um, I'm actually very excited to, to, to think with everybody um, along the theme of this meeting, um, talking about unsubordinated knowledges, differences, and rights. Um, and I'm hoping that part of what I will be um, uh, talking about uh, starts uh, or adds to that already ongoing conversation, because I think we, uh, globally, we have been thinking a lot about unsubordinated knowledges and how to um, how to make sure that they uh, that these knowledges uh, get more voice, more prominence in our scholarship, as well as in the forms of activism that uh, we engage in. So uh, my contribution today um, is called, it's titled, Unonga Indot, Gender in the Making in a South African Context. Um, and in, in this piece, or uh, with this work, my interest is to really engage with 
a phenomenon that all of us are aware of um, that looks at gender. But my interest is really to unpack the usefulness of gender within a South African context um, and drawing it from other parts of the African continent, uh, looking, reading it alongside uh, work by uh, an anthropology scholar, Ifi Amadiyume, whose work uh, is explored in many texts, including male daughters, female husbands. So I will start it from that point um, and, and, and unpack this notion of Nonga Indo that, that I am presenting um, as an opportunity to, to, to return uh, to the space of, uh, of the power and subordinated knowledges. And I will read the text. So it is Unonga Indoda, Gender in the Making in a Southern Context. Almost 30 years since its first publication, Ifi Amadiyume's ethnography of an eco town, Nobi, in eastern Nigeria, continues to fill a gap in gender and sex studies. Written by a scholar who is familiar with the area of study intellectually and intimately, male daughters, female husbands, navigates through the olden days, both pre-1900 and the modern period, the colonial and post-independence period in Africa, excavating which histories of Africans telling their own stories they have become. In the same breath, it offers a critique of colonialism in relation to gender and sex arrangements in eco society. But what can be argued as a decolonial study of gender and sex in a Nigerian town navigates through contemporary hang-ups in the African country. This paper, following Amadi Yume's approach and depiction of gender in the making in Nigeria, looks at three related specific moments of understanding gender and sex attributes in a South African country. Much has been written about gender and sex in Africa, with many questioning the relevance and applicability of the concepts in African contexts. While there is general agreement that gender is a socio-cultural context construct, sorry, applications of this differ in various locales. One critique argues that feminists writing from Western perspectives often limit gender to the nuclear family. At the core of the critique is the gap in knowledge production and devaluing of theory making outside the West. These scholars note how African local realities are overshadowed to the extent that an analysis of gender and the family from an African context is very limited or understood a Western paradigm. Oyewumi suggests rethinking the category of women in African contexts as non gender, not relying on body type, and associated gender limitations to stereotypes. Woman need not be a synonym for wife. Oyewumi argues relations of wife and husband or who takes position of husband and wife are much more complex in African societies. In exploring the notion of female husbands, Amadi Yume highlights the flexible gender system and how the dependence of female on female labor in agricultural production made possible for women to have access to each other, to markets and cash. While women did not own land, this did not stop them from being wealthy, sometimes as men or even more. In circumstances where there was no son inher to inherit land from the father, a woman as a male daughter was allowed to own land. Wealth for women offered opportunities for them to have wives. Thus female husbands and male daughters could marry women and obtain wealth. Such levels of power and economic emancipation freed wealthy women 
from domestic responsibilities as they could marry whites. Acquiring a wife by a woman was a matter of status and prestige, as well as of necessity. While this pro-female institution of female husbands and male daughters gave authority to men, the educated elite and Christian converts soon abandoned the colonial period. Woman-to-woman -woman marriages and various types of marriage arrangements have been recorded in many societies as early as the 16th century. Many African societies have and continue to practice woman-to-woman -woman marriages involving a woman taking on the role of female husband to another woman. The female husband becomes a social and legal father to her wife's children. Female husbands take on wives for purposes of increasing the lineage, especially when the female husband is barren. To expand the female husband's wealth and status in society, while also avoiding domestic related activities that can be done by the wife. Or to gain prestige and respect in society by marrying a daughter. The practice of woman to woman marriage is intricate and involves a number of players. Woman to woman marriage continues to be important and relevant in African societies where barren female persons want to continue their families. Although women-to-women -woman marriages are argued to be different from contemporary same-sex marriages, elsewhere I demonstrate the continuities as well as the position of the female husband. While there is general acceptance of Oyewumi's analysis of gender, paying attention to specificities of local cultures, the Bakare Yusuf shows some caution. In the search for an analysis of gender that takes specificities into context, the workings of power have to be carefully analyzed. What is understood as gender in some contexts appears as forms of, senior, of seniority or rank in another. The underlying power dynamics in either character need cautious unpacking, rather than replacing one with the other, or suggesting the limits of one and the expensiveness of the other. Bakari Yusuf notes how seniority through respecting elders often masks different forms of violence that are gendered. A critique of gender's applicability should not necessarily mean its disavowal. More specific to this paper is how language through African terminologies are sometimes deployed as evidence of a pre-colonial This kind of pre-existence and essentialism, whilst easily attracted, can lead to a theoretical getting. In this paper, I engage with the term nongaindo to illustrate how a host of factors including language, character, visibility, aesthetics, and form make gender. Unonga Indoda is thus used as a device to argue for a state beyond gender. In this section, I talk about the many phases of gender. Transgender studies have opened up possibilities to think of gender as not limited to a binary. Similarly, studies emanating from India on hijras and kotis suggest a third sex or non gendered beings, which challenge and destabilize heteronormative gender and sex binary assumptions. While transgender and intersex are slowly gaining traction in the African context, it is important to note that gender has not always been thought of in terms of the binary. Writing on the 19th century eco society, Ahmad Yumen notes how a flexible gender system mediated the dual sex organizational system. Visible through the structure of the economy, both male and female, men and women had access to different forms of money and cash. 
Maduna argues that sex description did not determine specific gender roles. Concerning children already at birth, there was similar treatment of sexes as both male and female born babies were circumcised after eight days. Children were, were highly regarded as they could reciprocate care economically or socially to their parents. Regardless of their sex, children were considered in economic terms. Their value communicated through songs. Curiously, no mention is made of intersex babies, although Madhume makes clear that all children were highly regarded. This curious omission begs for questions about the extent of sex binary disruption in African societies. As we all know, gender is not limited to sex. Rather, as Ahmad Yume illustrates, gender as a system incorporates responsibility, care, economic participation, and familiar relations. Language is central to understandings and interpretations of a gender system. Ahmad Yume illustrates how the gender system changed its language with the introduction of Christianity by colonialists. Religious colonial conquests changed forms of worship, as well as the language of divine beings, alienating people from their forms of worship. God replaced she, a genderless equal word used for both male and female deities. When it came to worship, the language of gender took center stage. God was seen as a he, a male figure with a son, and thus imposing masculinization of religion. In a poignant essay on the critique of colonial con conquests on gender and sexuality in Africa, Stella Nyanzi warns that, quote, language and language beyond the English medium into diverse African languages and tongues is important towards queering queer Africa. Cultural and indigenous understandings of gender, gender spirits of ancestors who may possess individuals offer socially appropriate notions of handling fluid, transient gender identities. As already stated, Ahmad Yume's exploration of the flexible gender system made way for women to be female husbands and male daughters. Such a system transcended the man, woman, and male, female, gender, and sex binaries. Transgender and queer theories did not apply in the context of Nobi, although by extension, it could be argued that Ahmad Yume's work in the ways it challenged the binary and gave expression to multiplicity of being paved way for transgender and queer relatives in the African context. Most glaringly, Ahmad Yume already argued prior to theories of gender diversities that the idea of women as a homogeneous category should be rejected. Jane Bennett agrees that woman is certainly not a relatively straightforward term. Women over different periods could hold a multitude of positions and embody different gender positionalities. There is no generic woman or African women. Women's lives, like all people, are not static. They change over time and are affected by various factors such as race, class, globalization, marriage, age, name it. Even without a feminist, Western feminist language, Nobi society illuminated a version of African feminisms that predated Western feminist discourses. With the rise of colonization and the binary gender system in place came new forms of power distribution. The Warren Chief system, which gave Nobi men quick power and stripped women of their participation in politics and government was implemented by the colonial regime. This new form of government was always antagonizing women. 
However, women's resistance and agency did not falter. What can be seen as a gender war <coughs> characterized the post-independence period in Nova society. Age-grade social clubs also gained prominence. As they acquired new wealth and ideologies through the patriarchal colonial regime, men reinforced their determination to marginalize women's position. The unanticipated 1977 police raid, police arrest of elderly Nobi women exposed this rule of men. That rule, and I put it, is the arrest of the women's council leaders is a landmark in the political history of North for several reasons. For the first time in their history, the women thus assaulted found themselves denied their effective militancy and self-protection and struggle against the men. It is further argued that Christians and Western influenced elites regarded the women's militancy as unfeminine. At the same time, male representation was elevated to the image of God. The entanglement of sex and gender became what I call an unholy union. With all these forces in place, women's solidarity weakened and breaking gender rules was policed and punishable. Even with social achievements, women could no longer attain male or husband status. This shift in gender, as mapped out in Amadima's work, are a compelling entry for this paper. In tracking the notion of non order presented in this paper, similar patterns will be uncovered. And in this following section, three parts, I will unpack non order within a South African landscape. In exploring the notion of longa and order, I draw from empirical research based on a qualitative study, a literary text, as well as visual arts. Empirical research for this was conducted in 2016 amongst a purposive sample of uh, Tosa speaking women in the Eastern Cape in South Africa between the ages of 40 and 60 years. Um, these women a part of um, a lesbian, bisexual, uh, and trans or queer intersex organization in South Africa. And in this paper, I draw extensively from one, pers one participant's interview, who I call Bondi, where she reflects on how she was called Nonga Indoga growing up in the rural city. I also look at the work of a, a and this is a literary text uh, titled Zono Zako Zia Kuchigela. Good luck, Thais. By Sipokazi Angelina Dazela, which forms the second source of data. In this novel, the author presents a dialogue which unravels the meaning behind Longa Indo. Lastly, I present a work of art entitled Unonga Indo by a South African artist, Nicola Baslo. These are incomparable moments, intriguing in their own rights. Compelling within them is the manner in which each actor in each setting signals a different version of this notion, yet all alluding to the destabilization of sex and gender binaries. Unonga Indo that carries a heavy gendered meaning. And packing its significance here, two different forms of evidence offers new insights on what I present as gender beyond gender. So, in this extract below, um, I take it from an interview with Undi, a 50 year old self identified lesbian who grew up in rural Eastern Cape in South Africa. During interviews, Participants were asked to recall words, terms, or phrases that they were called while growing up. In this extract, Bundy remembers how in her village people used to call her Nonga um, Indo. And I'll read this extract. It is translated uh, from Isikosa to English. So Bundy says, Nonga Indo. They used to say that to me. I don't know, I don't want to lie and say that I was a lesbian. I didn't even know that word lesbian. I 
think, I just think at about age 17, when I was called you know, kind of, I used to wear pants and shirts, not knowing if they were for men or women. People used to say, I am dressed funny, especially people my age. They would say I dress funny and that I like men's clothes. I would be happy because my older brother would keep these shirts and then I would look like no back door. This would happen when there was a ritual a ceremony at home. I would be asked by older women to go and get cups to make tea or something. So I would have passed the fire where women were cooking. They would then say, there goes no back door. Who, who would say this to you? The women? Wouldn't respond. Yes, the women. The women would say that. They would look at you and they see you know, and you think about it later and realize yeah, I resemble men. It would even sound better when they say, oh, find out that that a coin. And then a daughter told, oh, she looks like her father. At that point, you would relate to this phrase because maybe you didn't fully understand Ongayendo. But you would understand when they say you are like your father. But it was not a word that brought negativity to both listener and the speaker, at least in my village. People would talk about Ononga Endo, and when you looked at them, you saw women who were tough, fit, masculine, and fearless. Very tough people who liked wearing overalls. But, but even at rituals, these women would wear tracksuit pants, work suits, and turtlenecks. There was nothing about femininity there. But that same woman had a husband in the village. There was nothing about homosexuality there. That a person would be a homosexual. This was a woman who had a husband. Villagers would say it nicely. They were honorary dogs. That is my understanding. And that is, what, that is why when it was said to me, because I used to like wearing shorts and t-shirts and people say, here is no guide dog. So my understanding was that it was a person who resembled man while a woman. Close. The term no guide used to be popular among Sekosa and this is speaking people, referring to masculine women, men like women. The word daughter is men, both languages, and that's no guide dog, referred people, referred to people who are like men. In some contexts, it has been assumed to relate only to women who have chosen not to have relations with men. Women in same-sex relationships, lesbian women, women whose lives are not limited to heterosexual lifestyle. However, as Nomano Chopakad shows in her study among 50 black women loving women in Soweto, Johannesburg, South Africa, Nonga Indo was the least used and understood term among this sample. Yet within the study, Akada states the term implies a masculine gender expression. If terms such as non gaindo are understood in the notion of gender expression, especially masculine expression of behavior and of and or bodily form, it can be argued that same-sex practicing women are not only socially misunderstood, but are expected to have sexual relations with men, despite their gender non expressions. Non-sexual sex practices. That was a quote from that. Other scholars note that this term has often been considered as derogatory, referring to female-born persons who are thought to want or pretend to be men. However, as the extract above shows, these assumptions have fallen short of understanding different implications and uses of this term. The lack of vernacular terms to refer to communities that are not heteronormative has contributed to the over-reliance on English terms. As Mpundi states above, she was referred to as non gaindor prior to her own awareness of the term lesbian, or self-awareness of this identification. In a village, this term did not apply to her sexuality or sexual practices, rather, it associated her with her father and an acknowledgement of her aesthetic. Most significantly, she was aware of other women who were called non and they were known 
married men participated in cultural events in respected in the village. Thus, the term connected her to others into a sense of community. Fundi's use of the term is similar to the way Sipokaz Gazela's novel, Isono Zakozia Bujikela, the English translation is Your Sins Will Turn Against uh, The novel deals with the term Nonga Indota in a dialogue between the novel's main character. The characters is Noam and her mother in law, Nomeva. In the dialogue, Noam is telling Nomeva how Umlo, Nomeva's husband, is treating her while they are married. The novel, the reader gets to know of Mbumlo's abuse and mistreat of his wife and also his relationship with another woman, Sarah. Mbumlo's character and behavior is revealed throughout the text, but more specifically in a dialogue when Nomeva is asking no one to reconsider her decision to divorce Mbumlo. No one responds, and I'll, the, the book is in its course, but I'll just read the English translation that I picked up. That I picked up. Uh, so the character says, where have you ever heard of a man telling you directly that you are very, that you are very ugly while married him? Do you know that Umlo refers to me as no guy that when he calls me? He told me he regrets getting married to me while there is Saram In the novel, no one proceeds with the divorce and vows not to marry again nor expose her children further nutrients. While it may seem she is speaking in defiance of her mother's her mother-in-law's wishes, Noam is claiming self-ownership and protecting herself and her daughter. One scholar notes how the name Noam, meaning of myself, shows how this character by her actions is indeed her own person and not anybody else's. She rejects to be called by her husband and also rejects to remain married to him, thus succumb to his abuse. This act of refusal is important in the face of being called no more. Umlo was disrespecting, demeaning, and also insulting no one when referring to her as no more. In this context, the term is used in a derogatory manner to belittle the wife. Literary scholar Zlibele Mdumane argues, quote, from Bumlo to insult his wife in her face, reveals his deep-seated disregard for her and his lack of reading, close quote. Mdumane is correct to point out Bumlo's weaknesses in his text, for it is he who seems to lack discipline and regard for his wife. His failure as a man, father, and husband exposes his inability to take responsibility for his family. Calling Noam Kunonga Indo is a device to diminish her. Instead, this works against him because Noam uses this as grounds to divorce Mbumba. In the end, it is Noam who wins by fighting against abuse and claiming her freedom. Mbumba eventually gets sick of guys. South African artist Nicholas Slobo uses the artistic device of Nonga Indo in similar fashion reclaiming and revealing an aspect of culture that has often been hidden. Nicolas Lobo is a black gay male artist known for his intricate sculptures made of fabric, mixed material, and often rubber. In his numerous works, he weaves two forms of existing, imagining, a new world for him to exist in his multiple embodiments. As an African gay man who undergoes Tosa rituals, his, reference, his references in his creative works are embedded in his rich cultural heritage. Identity, ethnicity, masculinity, femininity, fragility, beauty, and strength all run throughout his pieces, which are all entitled to Tosa terminologies and sayings. The materials and fabrics he uses can be thought of as visual metaphors, revealing a new possibility of coexistence. For example, in his 2006 installation, Nonga Indo, with a dress installation, in and boots from the performance in the he states, I quote, I wanted to create this big exaggerated dress where the corset could fit someone, 
although of course it can be worn because the top is closed. It is a feminine structure, yet masculine at the same time. Organza is often used to make costumes for drag queens. The reason for commenting on this culture is that drag queens are disappearing. Men are getting back into being men. When I was coming out as a gay man, there were more men in makeup and dresses than there are now. The work celebrates that aspect of gay culture, the idea of acting as a woman. Although I should say that some of these men see themselves as women. In my culture, if you say you're gay, most people expect to see makeup and frocks. When I come in, when I come in shorts looking butch and wearing a rasta hat, I'm not gay. It's a celebration of femininity, beautiful and transparent. Clover translates Unonga and daughter to one who almost looks like a woman. It is curious to see that the reference is to one rather than men or women looking like a woman. The gendered assumption is that reference is made to a man. In the previous texts, Nonga and daughter has been directed to a woman looking like a man with men-like behaviors or mannerisms. This overturning of Nonga and daughter and possibility of switching between feminine and masculine self-reference suggests already the terms flexibility include genders. Thorbo unglues women from Nonga and daughter, making room for free flow of movements within this category. Men are able to move through and within Nonga and daughter. Moreover, as Thorbo states, men are getting back to being men suggesting that men have been something other than men or beyond what men are now. Their work reminisces a time gone by when there were more men in makeup and dresses as Thomas is. Thomas nostalgia is radically playful with language and the materiality of gender. Unonga and Dota's feminine and masculine duality acknowledges the balance and coexistence of both genders. Writing about this artist's body of work and drawing from other scholars, Andrew van der Fries confirms that Robert's figures, largely limp, unarticulated, nascent assemblages, bodies before or without fixed gender, seem to speak of the soma technique, the mutually generated relation between bodies of flesh bodies and knowledge and bodies quality. At the same time, while Unonga and Dota, the structure looks like a dress with a corset, it cannot fit anyone as the top is closed. The significance of this symbolism is striking. Thomas suggests that Nonga and Dota is access accessible to anyone able to enter its domain. However, the figure remains faceless, limbless, embodying rather the duality of these genders to the materiality of the structure. The visual cue of rubber as the head of a phallic object suggests. Similarly, the open dress at the bottom is both an invitation to a doll as well as an. In this work alone, the figure is transformed to a multiplicity of existence, possibilities and imaginations. The figure oozes boldness and confidence, allowing for new concepts and forms of expression to emerge. Thomas' figure speaks with authority, drawing from his own archive of queer language and identity. And perhaps this is why the dress's structure remains open and hoisted. There is a daring invitation to enter at your own risk. What happens inside, a possible transformation, is what the artist desires for the viewer. It is thus poignant for this installation to celebrate drag queens, an aspect, an aspect of gay culture often overlooked or people misunderstood. In a conversation between drag queens who are former winners of the Miss Gay Western Cape drag contest, uh, this happens in South Africa in Cape Town, Liberty glancing my piece sets the context of drag as a safe space, a space in which to explore issues of identity and expression a space that educates and promotes agency and autonomy, a space that, bleeds, that builds community and that promotes social inclusion of gender transgressive persons in various communities. And ultimately, a space that engages in social transformation through raising awareness and sensitization. For Thorbo, 
to and to evoke the image of a drag queen and related subculture in Ononga and Oda is a disruption to the binary that is often set out in existing versions of Ononga and Oda. The drag queen in this instance represents many things, fluidity, movement, erasure, inclusion and exclusion, femininity, masculinity, and other possibilities. Within the gay community, drag queens occupy a gray space. Sometimes it is not possible to know whether a drag queen is female, male or intersex, transgender or cisgender, man or woman, heterosexual, homosexual or bisexual, binary or non-binary. This fluidity, blending and blending of drag queen bodies and social roles allows for the expansion of gender through non gender in conclusion, how sex and gender continue to be conceptualized in the African context requires further investigation. There still remains many gaps in understanding African people's lives and the realities that are not, that are not limited to the gender line. The dominance of Western terminologies overshadows local realities and interpretations of sex and gender diversity. In many African countries, we have seen how verbal language has been used as a backlash and as forms of excluding sexual and gender non-conforming persons. One of the challenges that the gender and sex order faces currently is the rigid binary brought by the Christian colonial, colonialist, by Christian colonialism, which polices and legislates what and who is deemed outside of the normal and thus furthest from the energy problem. As Ahmad Yuma's work illustrates, the versions of what is regarded as normal, have changed over time. While we cannot undo the effects of colonial conquest on African bodies and beings, it remains possible to continue pushing against regulatory regimes that map all bodies against a limited normative frame. Many societies operate within the confines of gender. Even when opportunities to break these binaries exist, the starting point is often at, the, at acknowledging their existence. It may be difficult for now to imagine an African society without gender, one that is gen degendered. Perhaps this may not be desirable. As Surya Mundro points out, the notion of degendering, not yet accomplished in Western societies, has its own limitations and possibilities of excluding minority groups and those who do not hold power. But it can offer the potential of liberating many people. Mundro asserts, in a society where there is less concern for gender, androgynous and gender ambiguous people would face less barriers to social inclusion, social inclusion and gender norms overall would be less heavily enforced. The concern in this paper has been to move our understanding of gender beyond gender through the notion of non and In so doing, non and is useful for conceptualizing gender, conceptualizing diversity. Reflecting on Zaila Mokweli's photographic archive, Khabiba Badron notes how Mokweli makes use of the phrase gender within gender to refer to the notion of transgender. The phrase invites a perpetual state of reflection, both inside the self and in more collective spaces, and it acknowledges and welcomes multiplicity, not belonging to the time before Mokweli knew about transgender but as a form of knowing that comes from mutuality openness. non daughter and transgender occupy similar zones, although different. non daughter does not occupy the space within, it exists beyond the confines of gender. In its framing, non daughter is limitless and its shape malleable. The notion is both men and women, male, female, subversive and normative, communal and individual, it belongs to and can be claimed by anyone. And as Nicholas Strober's work shows, its fluidity is free, free flow and without bounds. Understanding the coexistence of these dualities and multiplicities is important. Long Ida has disappeared from everyday speech. The dominant narrative has branded this notion as derogatory, that even those who may use the term no longer see its power. Its disappearance from regular speech has left a gaping wound and a social distancing of any who may encounter themselves reflecting, reflected in this term. Instead, we have found ourselves reflected in borrowed terms, Western languages and gender relations that have packaged our existence 
in their cottons. One is queer or not, normative or non-normative, and the race is to get to the other side. Thank you.